it was called Future Tense. It's on. It was on Radio National. It was good to be on because we have felt we've almost been banned from national news media three or four years ago. No, three years ago, I think it was. Claire Connolly wrote an article where she quoted Bill and me. That was on the ABC News site and is one of the most widely read articles ever to be on the ABC News site, which a senior government minister complained about. And after that, we really couldn't get any anything on that site. So it was great to be on. It's great to see things are changing. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. For as little as a dollar a month, you can get early access to all our episodes and patron-only episodes. A big thank you to all our supporters so far. At the beginning there, you heard my guest this week, Dr. Stephen Hale, talking about what could be perceived as a resistance in at least the Australian national media to discuss MMT. And that resistance, I guess, is why we do this podcast. So if you're new to MMT, there's a link to Stephen's really useful What is MMT article in the show notes, which begins with one of the core statements at the heart of MMT. And I'm hoping to emphasize the importance of MMT by repeating it here. And it's this that monetary sovereign governments face no purely financial budget constraints. What that means for the layperson in, say, Australia, the UK, the US, Canada, Japan, to name a few, is that your government cannot run out of money because it issues its own currency as it spends. This is true for all countries with what's called monetary sovereignty. And you can check out our early episodes for more detail on the definition of monetary sovereignty, but it holds true for many nations and, of course, the nations I just mentioned. This often gives rise to the question, so why do governments collect taxes from us? Is it not so that they can spend that money at a later date? Well, no, that's not how it works. The government is the monopoly issuer of the currency, so it has to spend first before it can collect its money tokens, also known as pounds here in the UK where I live. If you or I try to spend pounds into existence, they call it counterfeiting and they send us to jail. So a government with a fiat currency imposes taxes on the private sector to get private individuals to need pounds, ensuring the pound has value. It then spends the money into existence to employ the people and resources that it unemployed by imposing its tax. It spends more money into existence than it taxes back, leaving pounds, dollars or yen circulating between individuals and firms in the private sector as they transact with one another. The pounds left behind after taxes are paid, the pounds we use every day to transact with, are known as the government deficit. And that can also be described as the private sector surplus by definition. So hopefully now you can see why taking away spending on services that keep people alive or not spending to save the planet because of fear of government deficits is completely misguided and destructive. This brings us to the second point that Stephen makes in his explainer article, and it is that all economies and all governments face real and ecological limits relating to what can be produced and consumed. That's the actual limit on government spending for a currency issuing government. So the question should really be, how do we use our government's power of the purse responsibly? This should be the focus of what we call politics in our respective nations, but it's been put on the back burner due to an irrational fear of numbers on a central bank spreadsheet and our general misunderstanding of how our money systems work. A misunderstanding augmented by our mainstream media and politicians. Stephen's upcoming conference in Adelaide is aimed at putting the literally burning issue of how to transition our economy into one that works for everybody and the environment firmly front and centre on the policy agenda. And you can skip back a couple of episodes to episode 39C for the full rundown of the lineup of the conference. What follows is the second half of that conversation, and it includes a rundown of the mechanics of the foreign exchange market, and also some follow-up to his recent appearance on ABC's Future Tense program. 
Just a note, this was recorded a couple of days before the UK general election in December 2019, as you'll hear, and all I'll say is that Stephen's powers of prediction have been validated. At the end, you'll hear Stephen talking briefly about the conference. You'll hear him talk about Stephanie Kelton, Bernie Sanders' chief economist, and Phil Lorne. And I've linked to some of Phil's work and other relevant things in the show notes. But of course, the really important thing to do, if it's possible for you, is to attend the conference. So if you or anyone you know can get there, please do. It's going to be amazing. Back here in the UK, I'm still developing my MMT show. And if you want to see how that's coming along, I'll be performing it at the Leicester Comedy Festival in 2020 on the 5th, 12th and 19th of February and at the Glasgow Comedy Festival on the 22nd of March. Links for tickets for those performances are also in the show notes. So thanks as ever for your support and the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive in. Let's just move on to your recent ABC appearance with uh, uh, Bill Mitchell. It was a good program on the whole. What was the uh, name of the program? Future Tense. ABC. It's called Future Tense. Yeah. It's on. It was on Radio National. It was good to be on because we have felt for a while as though we've almost been banned from national news media. In Australia, it's yeah, too popular. Felt like. uh, well, I don't know what it is, but um, I, I do know that three or four years ago, no, three years ago, I think it was, Claire Connolly wrote an article where she quoted Bill and me um, that was on the ABC News site and is one of the most widely read articles ever to be on the ABC News site, wow. which a senior government minister complained about. And after that, we really couldn't get any anything on that side. So it was great to be on. It's great to see things are changing. It was great to be on a national radio uh, show. What how this works is that uh, the presenter interviewed Bill and and me and the other contributors, I guess as well. I think there were another two uh, contributors for. Oh, well, I don't know how long Bill spent. Um, with uh, with uh, the journalist, but I did a, an interview where I was sitting in a, a little room in the ABC studios in Adelaide, and uh, he was in Brisbane, and we chatted for uh, probably an hour and a half. Okay. And there's you get about five minutes in the program. So so they do. If anyone listens to these programs and thinks, oh, why didn't they say that? Yeah, probably we did. <laughs> but uh, but it doesn't make the final cut. It's on the it's it's sort of on the cutting room floor. Well, um, but it was great to be on, and, and I think it was a fair attempt. Uh, some people were very critical. Some MMTists, you know how passionate people get. Oh yes, yeah. they were very critical of the journalist unfairly, I think, because uh, he's not an expert in economics. He was he was doing his best. I, no, I think uh, he did a great job actually, yeah. and. Um, uh, the only thing is in the in the edit, what happened is there there are a couple of talking points that came up by the sort of uh, MMT skeptics that obviously because it's not done in real time you didn't get to address, and obviously MMTers could hear that and they go no 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 MMTs already addressed these points, and uh, so so that will be where that's coming from I think. Uh, from the oh. audience but you know that they obviously we the audience should understand it's not done in real time and like you say you probably did respond to it but it didn't make the well, error I, I, but I, what, what I don't I, think I, they're I, worse i don't think they were skeptics oh okay well, um, well one of them maybe the guy from the wall street journal that's what was I'm, a skeptic about the political side of that, things exactly. but uh, peter martin the australian journalist who who, who was interviewed in the program uh, there were a couple of things he got wrong yeah but I, I, I actually, he said something along the lines, I have no problem with MMT. He did say I don't like some of the MMTers, which I think <laughs> might, might, maybe he's been on the receiving end I, of a few tweets. I didn't see, I didn't hear that. I mean, I, I listened to it just I listened recently. to it again. Oh, okay. I'm hearing saying right. that. I, I don't, I don't okay. think he's referring to any of the economists, let me make it clear. <laughs> I think, I think, uh, I think uh, you know. Sometimes people, quite rightly, feel very passionately when uh, journalists get the odd thing wrong. But I did want to. Uh, I did want to yeah. give you the right to reply to because uh, to yeah. to some of these things because 
I, I felt, and I think this is the next level of talking point that we have to deal with. Now, I, I, if, if we were talking to Warren Mosler, he'd be like saying, oh, no, I've been dealing with this since the 90s. But but this, I think this is where uh, commentary is going now. What they do is they go, OK, you're absolutely right about how the money system works. Government spends the money into existence and it taxes the money out of existence. But we can't trust politicians to tax at the right time. So we're not a fan of MMT because uh, we don't trust politics. We don't trust democracy. And they miss that the only policy in MMT is an automatic stabilizer. It, it, you don't have to trust politicians to, you know, that, MMT is not saying spend and spend and spend. And then when you see inflation, that's when you start taxing. And they, they present it like that's what you guys are saying. That's what the economists are saying. Hey, guys, just go out and spend. As long as it doesn't touch inflation, you're fine. So spend until you hit inflation and then tax. And it's like, you're not exactly saying that. You're, you're, what you're actually saying is, uh, we, yes, we need an automatic stabilizer. The one we've got at the moment is an unemployed buffer stock. We'd like to replace that with an employed buffer stock. It's not radical. Um, that's right. Well, you just answered the question. <laughs> right. <yes. laughs> I don't need to answer the question for you. Uh, there are other but, things you could say. Yeah. Of course. I mean, some of what they're talking about is just sheer nonsense anyway. In the, uh, oh, the, okay. I've really not noticed in, in the high income countries all that many politicians down the years who've, uh, and the last 40 years anyway, who've been spend, spend, spend all the time. Exactly. I don't, I've not noticed any of them, actually. Yeah. Margaret Thatcher was responsible for both fiscal and monetary policy in the UK, and you had incredibly high interest rates, and she ended up with a, 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 a fiscal surplus um, as, as well as she uh, drove the economy okay, into well, the ground and then drove the private sector into debt. I think if you can't trust government... If there's one thing you can't trust governments to do in recent decades, you can't trust them to run big enough deficits. Yeah, yeah. So, so James McIntosh again. The second thing he does is he goes to this thing where he goes, um, uh, "Look, we already had this debate about who should control the money supply, and we decided it a few decades ago. We decided to outsource these decisions to central bankers because they're at arm's length from politicians, and they wouldn't be susceptible to." Da -da -da politics and now first of all i wasn't around for that debate <laughs> and if you think it's settled we're living with the consequences of this arm's length approach and so i'd say i'd like to reopen this so-called settled debate and more importantly the people who are going to inherit what's left of the earth might like to be brought into this debate i, I mean what's your position on that the, the you know it's a done deal you know we 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 let technocrats deal with the money supply and it's working so well well, that, no, my only, apart from the fact they don't control the money supply, of course. Uh, yeah, it's uh, but, but, yeah, but um, that's a very weak argument for them to pursue because basically what they're saying is that in the early 1990s, a particular approach to macroeconomic management was adopted in most high-income countries around the world. Fair enough. Yes, that's absolutely right the view that governments should more or less balance their budgets, at least on average, over time and and uh, leave uh, control of interest rates to central banks who should be pursuing an inflation target and rely on private debt to drive the economy and deregulate the financial system. Absolutely. That was absolutely disastrous and it collapsed catastrophically in 2008. So what he's saying there is we decided to do something in the early 1990s. It was completely disastrous. It collapsed catastrophically in 2008. It's not worked since. Um, but we don't want to think about it again. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it, it's crazy. So and then uh, the, the other the other thing that um, Peter Martin said, and this is the reason I bring this up is because this is how the program ended. And I felt it was a bit like, uh, you know, we're not telling you how to feel about MMT, but this is the last thing you're going to go away with. And this is the quote. Mm. And, he, and the, there was no reply from you or Bill. Uh, in fact, what they do is the, the, he kind of imagines a reply from MMT. Uh, and, and so this is the quote from Peter Martin. 
his, uh, you know, and this is his problem with MMT as he sees it. Here's the quote. If the government announced, as Menzies did in the early 1960s, I'm going to run a budget, I'm going to run the budget into a bigger deficit, there's a risk that screen jockeys in the finance markets will say, the government's being irresponsible here. We're going to sell the Australian dollar and essentially make the dollar collapse. Now, we saw some of that in the mid 80s. The Australian dollar dropped to less, just under 50 cents. It was a pretty unpleasant time. And that's a real restraint. I suppose the MMT theorists' response to that would be, all right, maybe the financial markets will make things difficult for a while, but after a year or two, they'll see sense. But that's still a real constraint. So that, that, that's his quote. I, I, you know, if I, I may have got a couple of words uh, uh, out of place here and there. So there's a lot in there, and there's some definitely wrong things in there as well. So I'd love you to respond to that. There are. First thing to say is, before I do respond, to be fair to the journalist again, it wasn't a panel. Sure. He was interviewing us one after another, so it would have been difficult to come back to us, uh, I suppose. But um, the second thing to say is, uh, Peter, uh, I haven't actually met uh, uh, Peter Martin. I've been in contact with him uh, a little bit. He's uh, one of the better economics journalists in Australia, but uh, I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm right, but I've spent years uh, teaching people about international finance and exchange rates, and I have trained the odd currency trader in the past, and Peter hasn't. Um, and, but there were a couple of things that he was just plain wrong on the facts because his memory let him down. Uh, the, you shared the quote with me earlier. He said something about the Australian dollar going below 50 US cents in the mid 80s. Mm -hmm. And those were bad times, he said. Well, actually, he's entirely wrong, uh, which it surprised me a bit because he lived in Australia at the time. I didn't. But the Australian dollar depreciated. Um, in 1983, when it went from a fixed to a floating exchange rate system. In the mid-80s and across the rest of the 80s, and people can look this up for themselves if they like, they can go on the Reserve Bank of Australia site and click on where it says RBA chart pack and then click on exchange rates and there'll be a nice little diagram there that tells you the exchange rate between the Australian dollar and the US dollar. But across the rest of the uh, 80s, the exchange rate was pretty stable, really. So first of all, that's wrong. It didn't go below 50 US cents. The Australian dollar has gone below 50 US cents. I'll tell you when uh, in, in a minute. Um, the other thing he said, oh, things were really bad then. There was a recession in the early 1980s, actually in the mid to late 1980s, see, not that economic growth is the be all and end all of everything, but the Australian economy was growing much faster than it is at the moment. So that's not right either. Um, uh, what else? Oh, one of the reasons, I suppose, why you might, uh, if you were him, be worried about the Australian dollar depreciating is you might think it was be it would be because uh, maybe the spending would lead to a higher uh, um, trade deficit on the balance of payments. Well, as it happens, Australia had its record uh, trade deficit on the balance of payments at uh, the same time, roughly, when the Australian dollar was below 50 US cents. But that happened in 2001. Not in the mid 1980s. In 2001, the Prime Minister of Australia was John Howard. The Treasurer was somebody called Peter Costello. The right wing loved to talk about all the great management of John Howard and Peter Costello. We were in the middle of a decade when, for eight out of 10 years, the government ran budget surpluses. So the Australian dollar was at its weakest point against the US dollar when we were running a budget surplus. The US was running a deficit, we were running a surplus. Um, the uh, balance of payments position on, on the current account of our balance of payments was at its weakest point at that same moment uh, in time, actually, driven by um, uh, private sector borrowing, uh, property bubble, rising housing, Debt, uh, household debt uh, trebling between 
1996 and uh, 2012 or 2013 or so, um, and nothing to do with uh, the government running a fiscal deficit. Uh, there is a result in international finance called the Mies-Rogoff result, M-E-E-S-E-R-O-G-O-F-F. Kenneth Rogoff is quite famous amongst MMTists because he's one of the people who in recent times has, has launched a not very well informed attack. Uh, Mr. Spreadsheet. Yeah, that's right. Anyway, <laughs> he is also one of the world's most famous mainstream economists. I mean, potentially Nobel Prize winner because they do give Nobel Prizes to the strangest uh, for, for the strangest reasons. But anyway, um, if you want to call it a Nobel Prize, please don't write in. I know <laughs> it's not really a Nobel Prize. Um, but when he was a young economist in the early 1980s working for the Federal Reserve, he was given the job of using uh, every available theoretical economic model in order to try and predict changes in exchange rates. And he found that over a uh, short time period or even up to three years ahead, um, not only based on all the information which would have been available to you when you were making the forecast, but actually if you were also told everything in the world that happened expect, except the change in the exchange rate during the period when you were trying to uh, do the forecast over, that there was no economic model that was any use when it came to forecasting movements in exchange rates at all. This was quite a confronting result, and actually subsequent to that, mainstream economists more or less completely lost interest in exchange rates. Um, to put it another way, there is no simple relationship between government spending, the fiscal deficit, and what happens to the currency. And indeed, if a fiscal deficit means that the economy is very healthy, it might be a good place to invest and uh, you may find that um, as a consequence of that, there are uh, uh, there's, you know, capital flows coming into the currency rather than going out. The currency may appreciate rather than uh, depreciate, which has happened a lot of times in the past, including when Ronald Reagan ran big fiscal deficits in the US uh, back, in the, back in the 1980s. There's no simple rule saying a bigger fiscal deficit necessarily means the currency depreciates or even that a rising current account deficit necessarily means the currency depreciates. It depends on the circumstances. That's the first thing to say. Second thing to say is that in high-income countries like Australia and the UK, with well-diversified economies, our currencies have depreciated quite a lot in the past. Actually, the Australian dollar has depreciated across the last couple of years. Well, until relatively recently, there had been some downward pressure on the pound um, uh, post the, um, the Brexit referendum vote. That, that wasn't catastrophic. Uh, to a considerable extent, in competitive markets, uh, um, foreign companies selling in, the, in your domestic economy absorb the impact of the change in exchange rates themselves or pass it on very slowly. Otherwise, they lose, they lose market share. The world is a complicated place these days with global supply chains uh, in any case. So in major economies like the UK and Australia, First of all, if you run a bigger deficit, it doesn't necessarily mean the currency is going to depreciate. Secondly, if it does depreciate, it's not going to be catastrophic anyway. And thirdly, if you were that worried about it, you could do an Iceland and you could introduce capital controls and uh, restrict or temporarily even stop people selling the currency. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. You could do that too. So there's a whole series of reasons why um, Peter was being unnecessarily alarmist but the very first thing to say is he even got his facts wrong. Yeah, and, and uh, another uh, thing that popped into my head is uh, I, I can't remember who said it, but you know, if your inflation problem's not coming from uh, uh, excess demand, it's not going to be solved by uh, unemployment. Well, that's true, but uh, also a, a currency depreciation doesn't cause inflation. It might right. mm. cause a one-off increase in the price level. Right. Yeah. Uh, if you if you've then got 
contracts, including in the labor market, which are heavily indexed along sort of Latin American lines, then a, a one-off increase in the price level because of a currency depreciation might then feed a sort of vicious circle. Mm. Of, uh, mm. of inflation but that's uh, you're very far from that situation in britain or or, or australia so uh, um so i think there's very very little of what he said has any validity they paint this picture that, that there are uh, uh, i don't know financial market practitioners out there and they're wandering through a shopping mall of different currencies and th- they're going to favor some currencies and 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 not favor other currencies and uh, they're going to do some kind of magic with their computer keyboards, and all of a sudden your currency's worthless. I mean, that's the picture that he paints with that, you know, that well, you know his quote: "The government's being irresponsible. We're going to sell the Australian dollar." I, well, they I, could do. You know. They could do. Um, I'm just wondering whether to explain how the foreign exchange market works, but it's going to be even more boring than me doing the bond market I the would, other week. So. I would love you to do that if you've got the patience. I would love you to do that. Um, All right. Well, the foreign exchange market consists of uh, big investment and commercial banks act as market makers. Um, If you're a market maker on the foreign exchange market, what that means is that you you keep uh, inventories of the major currencies and probably quite a lot of minor currencies as well, which means you've got deposits in different banking systems. And you quote prices, you quote exchange rates at which you're prepared to exchange those pairs of currencies continuously over time um, on uh, electronic systems. Thomson Reuters has uh, one of the most important systems. I think the other one is called EBS, although these things may have changed in the recent past. But anyway, so you, you, you quote these exchange rates over time and uh, the market is largely dominated by about 10 very large financial institutions. They have what they call, what we call a bid-ask spread. So actually for each pair of exchange rates, they quote two rates, a rate at which you can, if we're talking about the euro and the US dollar, a rate at which you can uh, buy the euro and a rate at which you can sell the euro. And the gap between the two rates is their profit margin from trading on the market. As market makers, they're not trying to make money from speculating on movements and exchange rates. What they try to do is to manage their inventories so they don't suddenly accumulate a lot more yen or a lot less US dollars. They manage their risks and they make money on very fine profit margins in what is an absolutely enormous market. Um, What what is it? Uh, $5 trillion a day, I think, the turnover of the foreign exchange market. It's 100 times as big as world trade, the turnover of the foreign exchange market. So those are the market makers. Now, they deal with clients who are from a variety of financial institutions, but also other big organisations as well, and for that matter, central banks too. And these clients include, yeah, sure, they include speculators. If you are a speculator, if you're a trader, then maybe it's your job to manage a portfolio of currencies where you are taking risks to try and make a profit over time. And maybe your portfolio of currencies, I don't know, is the US dollar and the euro and the yen. And you're supposed to move funds between those three currencies. You've got limits in terms of the weight you hold in each currency, but you're supposed to move funds between those three currencies and between money markets in the three economies to make a profit over time. So if you think that the Japanese yen is going to appreciate uh, over the next few hours, then you'll buy more Japanese yen and you'll run down the amount of US dollars or euros or both uh, 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 that you've got. Uh, And you'll do that by um, using those electronic networks to buy Japanese yen from um, one one of the market makers. Now, if if lots of traders are doing that, if they all want to sell the US dollar and buy the Japanese yen because they think it's going to be profitable, they have a very short time horizon, these guys. They may be looking a week ahead uh, 
They're thinking about all the news items that are going to come out over the next week. They're worried about what those news items imply. Yes, for the strength of the national economies and the potential for interest rates to change in the future, but they're especially trying to think about the impact of these news items on the behaviour of other speculators. I think I've heard Warren Mosler say, uh, it's like uh, you're judging a beauty contest, but you're not judging what, what you th- who you think is the most beautiful. You're trying to guess what the judges are going to think are the most beautiful. That was John Maynard Keynes. Oh, was he? Said. Oh, sorry, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, no, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, 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 more or less, anyway. Okay. Um, the, now, if for whatever reason, it might be a good reason, it might be a bad reason. It kind of doesn't matter if it's a bad reason. If enough people believe the same thing right. if, if they all think oh the US dollar is disastrous in the near future the Japanese yen is going to go up then they'll all place orders with the market makers to buy Japanese yen and sell US dollars what the market makers will then find themselves doing is they'll see their inventories of Japanese yen falling below what they want to hold because they're selling Japanese yen and their inventories of US dollars increasing and they won't want those inventories of US dollars increasing too much at the moment because they think the US dollar is is going to lose value. So to avoid uh, um, seeing the inventories of US dollars keep rising, the inventories of Japanese yen falling, they'll increase the price of the Japanese yen, they'll reduce the price of the US dollar to try and balance demand against supply but it's the behavior of those speculators that's driving the market up or down and those speculators they're reading everything that they can possibly read Uh, as i said about economic events they also use um, technical analysis or chartism so um, they look for statistical uh, um, statistic, statistical regularities in the past, which they think they can use now in order to time the market, or they look for patterns on charts, which they they think uh, tell them something useful about uh, ab- about whether a currency is likely to. Uh, move out of its recent trading range in one direction or, the, or another in the near future. They've got maybe a seven-day time horizon, but that doesn't mean they wait a week in order to see whether they made good decisions a week ago, because actually they're reviewing these decisions the whole time. And generally speaking, if they buy Japanese yen and then it turns out the Japanese yen depreciates rather than appreciates and they lose money rather than gain, they don't blame themselves and think, well, that means we got it all wrong. Instead, they think, oh, well, some unanticipated event (laughs) has happened, but we better react to it now. So that's what drives currencies up and down over time. And sure, if there was a Labour government in the UK, Sad to say, I don't think there will be, but let's hope I'm going to look a fool when the election result comes out. If there was a Labour government in the UK and all those speculators decided they want to dump the pound, well, you know what? The pound would depreciate, at least for a while. Um, it, It might depreciate by a few percent very, very rapidly. But these speculators, they're not stupid. British assets then look really cheap. They look really attractive. Uh, you've got a new government that's coming in and uh, they're promising that they're going to invest in the economy and the economy is going to grow. And just as the stock market wouldn't crash. So uh, not that I'm all that interested in the stock market. So the pound wouldn't crash either. There might be some depreciation, but it would rebound again. And actually, uh, the currency depreciating, don't forget, has some advantages uh, um, Warren wouldn't like me saying this because I'm not talking from the point of view of the whole economy but I'm talking from the point of view of exporters and people who work in export industries if you're an exporter it's easier for you to compete now uh, in Australia uh, we have uh, our trade balance is well into surplus now now part of that is because we're exporting more and more coal and natural gas and helping to destroy the world but part of it is things like uh, uh, we have more and more foreign students coming here. Why? Because the Australian dollars are cheap. So it's not all doom and gloom, at least not for for everyone. I think my message would be that if you had a government informed by modern monetary theory who uh, came into power 
in the UK with a working majority in the House of Commons and introduced a, a sensible, realistic, responsible approach to fiscal policy and went about implementing a job guarantee and moving somewhat faster towards uh, um, uh, reducing carbon dioxide emissions over time and invested in the health system and higher education, for example, then I don't think any dislocation on the foreign exchange market would be anything other than very short-term and minor. And uh, it might not even happen at all. Mm -hmm. And and also, yeah, like you say, you want to build up the real stuff, the real wealth of the country anyway. What's, you know, rather than weaken it uh, in that situation anyway, it's not an argument for like, okay, well, we better vote for these, these, uh, surplus obsessed uh political parties so that the financial markets like us again and uh meanwhile you know unemployment's going up real productivity's uh, declining uh you know it, it doesn't seem the, the the right way to fight that kind of uh, threat at all well let me put it another way the the australian dollar Um, In about 2000 or 2001, as I said, it went to 49 US cents per Australian dollar. So Peter was only sort of 15 years out. There, He got the right exchange rate. um, uh, I benefited from that because I came to live here at the time and it meant (laughs) meant I got lots of dollars for my pounds so I could get a house. But um, Aussies really hardly noticed. Right. Unless you're going to go overseas, you're not going to notice, um, or hardly. There, were, there wasn't significant inflation or anything, as I was saying. Then in 2011 or so, um, everyone was talking about a commodities boom, and far from being 49 US cents per Australian dollar, it was 1.1 US dollars per Australian dollar. Right. A massive appreciation of the Australian dollar against the US dollar. The downside, it wiped out the Australian car industry. We don't have a car industry anymore. But in terms of Aussies, if you'd kept your job, you didn't really notice. Didn't make any difference. Hmm. Um, And then the Australian dollar has got weaker again now, and we're sort of halfway between those two. Right. Uh, Right. A bit nearer the first and the second, actually. But has anyone noticed? No. Oh, in short, the exchange rate don't have a huge impact. Except when, yeah, maybe when you go on holiday, you could say um, you could say there's winners and losers uh, every time there's a, a movement in exchange rate, and you know MMT, the job guarantee, it stops the losers having to happen, basically, right? Well, it limits the extent to which they lose, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, but um, we have a lot of experience now of floating exchange rates over the last, in Australia, it's uh, 35 years, and the pound has been floating longer than that. Mm. And the exchange rates moved quite a long way up and down over time. And uh, people talk about, as I said, the, the pound sliding. Well, you've had at least a couple of sort of ski jumps downwards yeah. uh, after the the uh, referendum vote, um, it wasn't catastrophic. Oh, yeah, I know. But I, people point to like avocados and Marmite and go, look, <laughs> this is it. Marmite's Zimbab- costing a tiny bit more. <laughs> Zimbabwe uh, next week. <laughs> okay, well, what's more important to you, having yes. a working, working health service and – Yeah, exactly. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you, you can't please everyone. <laughs> so this is this is definitely the last question. Uh, it's it's a bit technical. Um, uh, one of our uh, uh, patrons uh, is really interested in our episodes that we've had that have taken a deep dive into banking and bonds, and he just wanted some clarification on. He goes, there are several types of interest rates I hear discussed in connection with central banking. The interbank rate. This is AKA the base rate, right? He's asking the main one people mean when they talk about central bank interest rates. Uh, and then he say, oh, the yield on short term bonds and I guess interest payments on central bank reserves. Are these all the same as the rate listed on the Bank of England website, which apparently at the time was 0.75 percent? 0.75 percent. Yeah. The or, rate on the God. Bank of England website at the moment, I imagine, is still the rate which the Bank of England pays on private bank reserves. Right, yeah. 
Okay. The, the, the rate which they used to target was the interbank rate, but the interbank rate became unimportant when there had been lots of quantitative easing because banks that are stuffed full of reserves do not need to borrow very much overnight from other banks. Right. Uh, and there is a higher rate than that at which a bank can borrow – which I don't remember what it's called in the UK, but historically it was called the discount rate, right. uh, which a private bank could borrow from the central bank. Uh, so that there were three rates. Um, all those rates are somewhat different from each other. Right. Okay. I am afraid, uh, I, I, it, but I, I, if the person wouldn't mind going back through the first discussion that we had, not the second one, but the first one, um, I don't know, everything you want to know about banking, but we're afraid to ask, you called it something like that. Yeah, that's right. Then yeah. I think we answered those questions. Okay, all right then. So, and and the yield on short-term bonds, is that set by the central bank? I guess... No, but it could be. Right, okay. So, that, uh, that the market determines that? Um, sort of. When we say the market determines it... Uh, Short-term government bonds and uh, um, treasury bills, which are um, effectively government bonds that have less than a year to run, um, the rate of interest on them is going to be very close to the bank rate because if you have funds um, on deposit and reserves at the Bank of England, they're basically safe that's a safe government liability. If you have treasury bills which are going to mature in the next month or two, then that's another safe uh, uh, government liability. And if they mature in the next month or two, the price isn't going to vary very much in the meantime. So you could get your cash back very quickly or you wouldn't have to wait very long for them to mature anyway. So there really isn't much difference between having reserves at the Bank of England and holding treasury bills which are coming up for maturity. Now, when you're looking at longer term government um, debt, uh, um, treasury bonds, one, two, five, ten years, the um, yield to maturity on them. And that's not the only <laughs> rate of interest. Although well, I don't want to explain the difference between coupon rates and market rate again. No, no, no. We'll Go know back that. and listen yeah, to we'll the previous that. one. Yeah. The, the yield to maturity on them, the main influence on that, if it's not being set directly by the central bank, will be what the market expects the bank rate to be on average over time. Ah, got it. There is uh, normally a maturity premium. So you can see the yield to maturity on long-term government debt is usually above the yield on short-term government debt. Um, so, yes, the ex expected bank rate over time is one of the influences, but you do uh, usually get an additional amount in terms of the um, promise yield to maturity on longer term bonds. The reason for that is if you want to sell them to get your cash back early, there's a bigger risk that you'll make a loss when you do that because their prices are more volatile okay. over time, just yeah. a little bit. Um, however, uh, it is not necessary to allow the yield to maturity on government bonds to be set by the market, and indeed the Bank of Japan does not do so. Right, okay. As I think we explained yeah. before, because the Bank of Japan buys Japanese government bonds with 10 years to maturity and drives their price up and drives the yield on maturity down so that they've set that yield at zero and they've done that for a couple of years now. So the Bank of England does not do that, but the Bank of England could do that. If the Bank of England wanted to, it could set the rate of interest on government debt out as far as you want. Got it, got it. So, and just to clarify... The interbank rate, is that the same as saying the base rate in, in Bank of England terminology, to your knowledge? Um, I don't know what the term base rate means now. The, the official rate for the interbank rate, uh, uh, you, you, you liked this acronym when I mentioned it before, was SONIA. Yeah, yeah, right. Remember? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, sterling overnight interbank rate, SONIA. 
Yeah, that's what it's called. So if you want to find out about Sonia, yeah. if you're listening, then just go on the Bank of England website and right. type in Sonia and search, and it'll tell you all about it. That's the that's the interbank rate. Okay, and um, and when you brought up the discount rate there, what's happening there is it's almost like a punishment, right? That or it used to be that like oh okay, you guys, you banks can't sort out the loaning to each other. Now you're going to have to come to the central bank and and get a loan, and so it's a higher rate of interest, isn't it? Of the discount rate. Traditionally, yes. It it, it, it uh, again, it's not always been the same in different countries. Yeah. But um, in Australia, we have a simple system, which is like it used to be in the UK. Um, so we have something called the cash rate. The cash rate is the rate of interest at which banks lend to each other overnight. Um, the Reserve Bank of Australia pays interest on banks what we call exchange settlement reserves, their reserves at the central bank at a quarter of a percent below its target for the cash rate. So the target for the cash rate is 0.75%. The RBA will be paying interest at 0.5%. And in the event that a bank borrows overnight from the reserve bank, which doesn't happen very often, they pay a quarter of a percent above the target cash rate. So they'd be paying 1% interest if they did that yes and and so all right last last question so this again you mentioned that as this is me now i mentioned this you mentioned that as a result of qe if the bank of england wants to maintain a positive interest rate it now pays interest on reserve account balances i hope i got that right that's right okay great phew yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, okay so, that's what the bank rate is so our friend here is saying i thought the bank of england just set the base rate at will 0.75 percent at which banks can lend to each other, or am I confusing different categories of interest rate? You are confusing different categories of interest rate. The, what you're talking about is Sonia, which used to be targeted. That's the one they used to make the fuss about. But when they started doing quantitative easing, instead the fuss was uh, on the rate that the Bank of England pays. And the reason for that is that if all the banks have got loads and loads of reserves, they're not going to be lending reserves to each other overnight very often. Got it. So Sonia became unimportant and the bank rate became the important one. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks for all this, Stephen. You, we've gone, we've talked about the whole planet. We've talked about the uh, intimate details of the banking system. These are my favorite types of conversations. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I, 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 not everything I've said, I'm all that reliable on. If you, so uh, please find out about the genuine progress indicator. Yes. I'll share with Christian a link to uh, one of uh, Phil's best talks on that. But he's, uh, when we do the videos for the conference, Stephanie's talk is going to be amazing. Bill Mitchell's Just Transitions Framework is going to be amazing. And Phil Lawn's unveiling of his genuine progress indicator statistics and what they mean is going to be amazing too. There'll be loads of other amazing uh, things happening as well, but those are just the ones I'm highlighting for the moment. All right. Well, thanks for your time as ever, Stephen, and uh, all the best. Thanks very much. Bye. Cheers. Bye. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month, and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash mmtpodcast. You can also find me on Twitter at mmtpodcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino. And you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.